And barely a video goes by when I don't mention Dr. Creepen's Vault, the subreddit I set up so you could share your stories with me and I could read them all for you. And there's a good reason for that. So many fantastic, high quality stories sent directly to me that I just sometimes don't know which ones to do first. And I know you all love the longer stories and I do try to stick to them, but so many good short ones come along as well. It's only fair that once in a while I do an anthology video where I group together some of these shorter stories for your listening delight. And tonight is one of those videos, so we have three fantastic tales of terror for you this evening on three wildly different themes. So my dear friends, it's once again time to sit back and relax with your favourite drink and listen. Now, if you're reading this, then this would probably be one of those many rituals you've read on the internet. So you can either turn back now or stay to listen. If you oblige to this ritual's instructions and correctly execute them, you could be chatting with a soul that no longer lives on this earth in no time. However, beware that there are risks in the time period of you starting and ending the ritual, many of which are quite unfortunate. But don't think about that too much. Reread the instructions if needed, and you should be fine. To start off this ritual, you'll need the following things. Two candles, a lighter, Salt, white string, window length, black string, window length, gasoline, matches, a window, preferably one facing a field or woods, and an object of dear importance to the one you wish to speak to. Now that you have all the materials needed, you can start setting up the ritual. Once you've found the needed window, Put the candles on the right and left edge of the small slab you used to lean on and memorize what wonders your sight gives you while looking at what lay beyond the window. If you don't have one of those, then put the candles on the floor where the window's edges would approximately be if they stretched downward. By now you might have also guessed that you would be talking to your lost soul through a regular window and these candles are here to protect you from the spirit due to the fact that if there is no light left, the spirit can escape the dark void it's in, and potentially be parasitic, to say the least. So, for a precaution, there are two sources of light in case one blows out for whatever reason. Most spirits also consider these two flickers of light to be a sign of manners. Rather than you just turning on the lights, they can even learn to respect you, if you manage to pull off this ritual multiple times, without messing up, of course. Once the candles are set, take the white string and tape it onto the top side of the mirror or taping the black string on the bottom side. Do not do it the other way around. This can make the spirit think you want to harm them and this can surely raise the odds of the spirit thinking of you fondly. And trust me, you do not want a spirit thinking the wrong way about you. This can lead to, like I said before, things most unfortunate for you just keep that in mind. These strings represent the balance of your realm and the spirit's realm. Having this balance is the key to keeping your realms connected, or in other words, your consultation going. Which gets me to our next ingredient, salt. The salt, like you have most likely guessed by now, is your friend. Not only does it protect you, but more importantly, it is the border that separates the worlds you and your spirit are in. To make the border, dip one of your fingers into the salt and trace a rectangle around the window. Do this step a couple more times if necessary. Oh, and pardon me if I'm being overly dramatic, but get all the areas in your rectangular line that don't have salt on salted. It doesn't matter how much salt is at every edge, as long as there is. We cannot imagine the chaos that would erupt in this world if even one organism that does not or no longer comes from our world was to slip into our interval. So make sure you get this step right, like all the other ones. Trace the shape a million times for all I care, but get the job done. And keep this salt with you at all times during the ritual. 
With that said, we move on to the last item. Once you have acquired the important token of the one you would like to interact with, the ritual is ready. The ritual can only be started within the time gap of 12am and 3am, so yes, you will be doing this at night. The ritual works best on cloudy nights. It's okay if it's raining, but for some reason ghosts despise thunder while in this ritual, making them aggressive or sometimes they just don't arrive at all. So check the weather forecast closely on your ritual night. And don't forget that you also have to have all electronics and all cores transferred to a different time since you cannot have any outside world contact during the ritual. When the time comes, don't go to bed. Instead, wait from 12 sharp and stare out of the future glass that will be separating you from the being that wishes to be on the other side again. But don't worry. You have three hours to get yourself ready. And don't forget that you can end the ritual practically any time you want after dawn. But you can only start it after 12 and before 3. When you feel like everything is adequate, Take a few deep breaths, and you can begin the ritual. Start by blowing a hot breath through your mouth on the chosen window, to fog it up, and to not see and mess up the spirit realm transition. Turn off the lights, so the only visible part of the room will be shown by the warm fire coming from the candles. Once you have the candles lit, find the special object of this ritual, and burn it. If the object is not flammable, then use the gasoline that you prepared. It should do the trick. It's recommended that you obviously do this outside because not only will it save you from being engulfed in smoke or worse flames, but it will also attract the spirit much faster than burning their heated object indoors. Once you see the first flicks of burning orange on their object, immediately turn around and walk back to your house. Do not look back during this process, as doing so will let you see something no living human can yet comprehend. Stop exactly a step away from your house and recite the following poem. The wind shall howl, but this game is no foul. The darkened light shall give us some. With this we ask of you to come. I summon you tonight. Appear in my sight. Once this is done, calmly walk back into your house while closing the door behind you without turning around. Get back into your chosen room. Close your eyes and count to ten seconds. Once this is done, grab the salt bag you used and slowly come up to the mirror. Firmly grip your salt bag Make sure you show no signs of fear before you meet the spirit. Once you're close enough to the mirror, wipe off the fog from the mirror, and you should now see the spirit you wish to talk with, taking the shape of the body they used to own, then being in a dimension that is clearly not your own. I cannot tell you what it looks like simply because the views are very diverse, and every person that tries this ritual See something different and unique. Oh, and try not to piss yourself if you do see your desired spirit. If you do not see them, spray the window with the remaining salt in your bag. Blow out the candles. Turn on the lights in only that room of your house. And now leave your home. Sleep at a friend's house or hotel if you want. But you cannot return to your house for the rest of the night. You may return to your house in the afternoon, but I would recommend using that time for moving, since the spirit you summoned probably won't leave the current home you're living in any time soon, and the chances are you won't like a ghost living in your house, and this is something you won't like experiencing. You probably just bothered a spirit that did not like to be bothered, and this makes them angry, to say the least. You must move, only... Pack during the day and never attempt this ritual again if you ever want to live life normally, that is. If the spirit you called does show up, then congratulations. 
You've just done what very little of our population has done in all of history. You may ask the spirit anything you wish. However, there are a few things to keep in mind. Do not mock or insult the spirit. Even if it does seem like a close friend or family member, you never know who's really behind that corpse. As the soul and body have been disconnected in the transition to the afterlife. And the last thing you'd want is an unfamiliar soul getting, well, like I said, mad. While the spirit will answer your questions truthfully, will occasionally ask you some as well, and lying is not an option. If you decide to lie, or ignore its question, you'll either get angry or just start to slim down the truth to your questions, until it might just stop answering at all. Don't think you can get away with getting the most important answers out of the spirit and then abandon ship. No, that's not possible. Since when you start the ritual, the spirit starts the conversation, and with it comes the first question. So, answer truthfully, no matter how foolish or disturbing the questions are. Another scenario that you might be unlucky enough to be in is if one of your candles suddenly blows out. Stay calm and don't do anything stupid. The spirit you are talking to senses one shred of tension inside you, then it knows that you are afraid, and will use that to its advantage, and will try to convince and manipulate you to open the window, even if it has to think up impossible lies. And don't think you're out of the woods if your window can't open. In fact, you have a worse fate to deal with, as if you give in you will smash the window rather than opening it. Continue on the ritual smoothly. and Never look at anything besides the spirit, and only the spirit. If you accidentally do show that you are scared, then ignore any threats or pleads the spirit has. It will do anything possible to stop you from listening to the spirit. If you open that window, then not only will the spirit escape into your world, but it will also take your body and fling your soul into non-existence, into the dark void it has been in for the past eternity. So, continue the ritual and finish it ASAP, as soon as you know it's morning, that is. Oh, and I almost forgot to say, if you ever hear footsteps somewhere in your house, or perhaps a figure sprinting in the exact direction to your room, and knocks on your door with voices sounding familiar yet, talking otherworldly words and laughing hysterically ever so often, ignore it, and continue on with the ritual normally. It's probably just the spirit messing with your head. Probably. But it's best to still not open your door to see what lies on the other side, as sometimes it's just best to leave things that aren't supposed to know, well, unknown, for your own sanity. And one last thing. If the ghost you're talking to ever stops in the middle of a word and stares ahead right above your head, almost like there is someone right behind you, do not turn around. Continue the ritual and do not look back until you've finished the ritual. On more than one occasion, you might feel a cold breath on your fingers. Who am I defending your last shimmer of hope? You might also hear voices behind you calling your name and to help them. Some even might sound very familiar. On rare occasions you might even feel a hand on your shoulder and the cold breath moving right up to the top hairs on your head. But pay no mind to all of this and do not look back. If one candle blows out, then everything's still fine. But take this as a serious warning as it is your first and final one everything in your might to stop the second candle from blowing out as if it does well in that case it is the worst case scenario but as long as you resist the urge to look back and wait until the first glimpses of sun rays are coming from the horizon you will survive with all this said the ritual's conclusion approaches at a fast pace to the end of the ritual you must ask the spirit this sentence May I move on? If the spirit replies with a, I let you go, then you are free to thank the spirit, 
Blow out the candles and leave the room. Try not to go into the room with the window for the next couple of days, just to make sure the spirit leaves your house, but other than that, you should be fine. But if the spirit responds, I keep you in. Then, well, I suppose you'll just have to continue the ritual until the spirit accepts your departure. But now that this ritual is behind you, continue your life normally. There are no catches. Your house isn't haunted, and neither are you. Just try not to open your ritual window that often, just in case. But, well, you correctly performed the ritual and got all the information you needed. Or perhaps you have more questions that require you to repeat the communication. I've never really been into reading. It's just always seemed so monotonous. Picking up a book and looking at tiny black and white words until you get too bored to continue. At least, that's how I used to feel about it. My hatred for reading had to change when I met my girlfriend, Amy. The first time I met her, I was at the public library. I was a poor college kid and didn't have a computer of my own, so I had to use the computers at the library to print off any kind of papers that I had to write. After being there for at least three hours, I had to take a short break from my paper. I got up and took a lap around the small subsection of the library where all the computers were kept to separate them from the people trying to browse and read the books. While I made my way around the computers, I noticed a beautiful girl who looked like she was just as stressed as I was. She had blonde hair with pink highlights on the ends and rose gold glasses that seemed to complement her blue eyes perfectly. Oh, the type of girl you can't walk past without saying hello. And so, I didn't. I mustered up every ounce of confidence I had, walked up to her and introduced myself. I found out that her name was Amy and she was just as eager to get out of the library as I was. We decided to leave the papers and go and get something to eat. As the night progressed, we seemed to get along perfectly. The only thing different between us was the fact that she absolutely loved to read. Obviously, if this was the worst floor I could see in her, then we were going to get along great. I was right. It's been almost two years now. We both have steady, decent-paying jobs. After about six months, Amy agreed to move in with me in my little apartment, which was close to campus. It was actually pretty nice for what we had to pay for it. In short, everything was perfect. <laughs> I'd even begun to read on my own periodically. Every day, for at least an hour, Amy would curl up in our big lounge chair and disappear into whatever book she was reading that day. A couple of days a week, I'd pull up a chair beside her and read with her in the quiet. I never got anywhere near as into my books as she would, but all I wanted was for her to see that I was perfectly capable of reading for an hour, even if I didn't exactly enjoy it. Sorry, I know you didn't come here to listen to a soppy love story, so well, I'll get to the point. The day that everything went downhill started completely normally. I woke up at seven, kissed Amy good morning, got dressed and ready, and left the house for work at eight. When I got to work, I sat down and, before I could even start doing anything on my computer, a new message notification popped up on my screen. I clicked on the notification and it took me to my email. The message said, So, you'd like to read now, huh? Obviously, I checked to see who'd sent it, but there was no email address. I typed a response into the bar. Who is this? In less than five seconds, there was another new message. It said, I have something I think you'll love. Again, I responded, Who is this? Check your mailbox. After I'd read that message, the email conversation closed, and even when the police tried to find it, there was never any evidence of it having existed. I thought that it had to be some stupid joke. Uh, some stupid kids are just sending me these emails to make me look stupid. However, it couldn't hurt to at least check my mailbox, just to be safe. I called Amy, hoping she hadn't left for work yet. 
Hello, she said. Hey, have you left the apartment yet? No, I'm way out of the door now. Why? When you leave, can you just check the mailbox? I'm waiting on a package. Oh, sure, just a sec. I heard her close the door and walk down the stairs. I nervously waited until I heard the metal door of the community mailbox swing open. No, nothing in here. Sorry, love. Well, that's okay. I was just curious. Have a good day at work. Love you. And then I hung up. Now that I knew it was just a sick joke, I was able to sit down and get my work done. It wasn't until about 11 that I got up, refilled my coffee, and got something to eat. Walked into the break room where a couple of my co-workers stood, talking quietly amongst themselves. I filled my cup of coffee and sat down on one of the chairs to relax for a while. And that's when my eyes landed right on the employee mailboxes and the small wrapped package lying in mine. I almost spit my coffee all over the room when I saw this. I jumped out of my seat, grabbed the package out of my mailbox and ripped the plastic off of it. Inside the package was a small leather-bound book that looked like a journal, but well, the words on the inside were printed, not handwritten. The most disturbing part was that the only thing on the cover of the book, front and back, was my name in bold print in the centre of the front cover. Well, I was horrified, to say the least. Just the fact that my name was on the book was enough to make me uneasy. My first thought was, maybe it was Amy. The only way to find out was to open the book and see what was inside. The first page said, Chapter 1, 1993. This is the year I was born. The book graphically described my birth, and then described every big event that had happened to me in the first year of my life. It was unbelievable how much this book seemed to know about me. I flipped through the pages and noticed that there was a chapter for every single year of my life. Curious, I flipped the pages to 2001, the year my mother had passed away. Sure enough, the book described my mother discovering that she had stage 3 breast cancer, and then continued to describe her fight until it brutally described every detail of her passing, up to her closing her eyes for the final time in my father's arms. I was fighting back tears at this point, but even though it was hard, I kept reading. Now I flipped to the chapter titled 2013, the year I'd met Amy. I was horrified when I read every single little detail of me, slowly falling in love with her and eventually asking her to move in with me. The book had every single detail of my life, perfectly down to every last detail. If this were true, I had to know where this book ended. I flipped to the last chapter. 2015. This year. The chapter starts off slowly, talking about my job and my new life with Amy, and then I reach June 15th, today. Talks about me finding the email, discovering the book, sitting down into the store and beginning to read it. And then it said, Amy is pushed in front of a passing car while walking to work. Her death is ruled an accident. My heart stopped when I read this. I dropped the book and pulled out my phone to call Amy. I've never been more relieved than when I heard her voice. Hello? Hi, baby. Are you on your way to work yet? No. Why? Stay there. I'm going to come and get you today. I can walk. It's only a block. You don't have to leave work. I'm coming. Just stay there, please. Is everything okay? Yeah, I'm going to leave right now. Just stay right there. Okay, I'll see you when you're here then. I hung up, slid the book into my pocket and ran to my desk. I grabbed my wallet and keys and just as I was about to leave, a new message notification appeared on the screen. I nervously clicked on the icon and was brought into the email application. The message made my blood run cold. It's already too late. And with that, 
I started to run, down the stairs, to the parking lot, and into the car. I pulled my phone out again while I sped towards Amy's work. She didn't answer. I called again. No answer. By now I'd turned the five-minute car ride into two minutes, and as I took the last turn to get to the diner, I was stopped by a barricade of police cars and ambulances. I stopped my car and ran towards the barricade. Sadly, though, I already knew what I would find. As I burst through the line of policemen, I caught a glimpse of the shirt Amy wore every day to work. I fell to my knees, explaining that the bloody mess lying on the ground was my perfect girlfriend. They loaded her into an ambulance, but when I got to the hospital, they told me exactly what I knew they would. Amy was waiting outside by the stoplight for me to arrive when she took one tragic step too far into the road where she was hit by a car, killing her on impact. For the next week, I was miserable. I didn't even leave bed for anything more than to go to the bathroom. I spent my time crying and then dozing in and out of sleep. The one girl who had ever loved in my life had been killed, and I was the only one who knew it wasn't an accident. I could show them the book, but they'd either call me crazy or blame me for it. I won't be held responsible for the death of the only girl I've ever loved. It doesn't matter anyway. In the week that I've been laying here in bed, I've taken some time to do some reading. I finished the last page about an hour ago. Now, I'm waiting. Waiting for the man that killed Amy to come here and finish the job. I can already hear him walking around outside my bedroom door while I type this. I know you'll all be told that my death was a suicide. After all, it would make sense. Hopefully, at least one of you reading this will know the truth. He's knocking on the door now. I suppose I should go. At least I know it'll be quick. My friend asked me one day in October, Hey, Jesse, do you want to come to a bonfire at my house tonight? I'd never been to a bonfire before, and didn't have a ride to their house two miles away, but he insisted that his father could give me a ride. It was a very quiet drive. He was acting a little shifty, but I didn't really think anything of it. He'd always been anxious and socially awkward. I didn't know his family well, but his father had never been much of a talker. Is Mrs. Peterson going to be joining us? I heard she was... What I started to say was that she and Mr. Peterson were separated, and she was living in her mother's house, but based on the tension in Mr. Peterson's cheekbones, I cut my question short. Nope, she's still at her mother's. I was quiet the rest of the trip, not wanting to crush any more eggshells underfoot. The truck's brakes squeaked as it pulled into the gravelly driveway. The house was just a few minutes away from the wilderness and deep pine forests of Oregon. Jacob led me to where the rest of his family was standing, to an enormous pile of firewood in the backyard. Well, looks like it'll be a pretty big fire, I said anxiously. How hot would this thing burn? Ah, oh, They're always smaller than you think they'll be, but it'll do the job nicely, Jacob's father grinned. He seemed in a better mood. Jacob's two older sisters began throwing gasoline onto the wood, drenching it with highly flammable fumes. My tension rose. I stepped a few steps away from the pile. This was looking like the forest may catch fire with this enormous blaze. Jacob, his sisters, and father stood back as well, as Mr. Peterson lit a match. They all seemed strangely nervous and excited, but all I could feel was the tingling sensation of fear in my stomach and fingertips. Oh, I've been looking forward to this, said Mr. Peterson slowly. The match flew from his hand onto the pile of wood. The pile erupted into an enormous fireball, a hungry, raging inferno devouring the offering of wood by these puny mortals. The heat was so intense I felt as if the skin on my face was shrinking onto my skull. Jacob asked me if I could sign off a merit badge for him, fire starting or something, 
and was very particular about how to put the date and the time. Well, Jesse, they can be pretty finicky at the office, he stuttered out. One of his sisters began throwing log after log onto the fire in a frenzy, cackling all the while. Burn, burn, burn! At the last exclamation, she tossed one of the containers of gas straight into the fire, on the end closest to me. Nicole, no! Mr. Peterson yelled, but it was too late. The can exploded, sending a fireball in my direction. I fell backward as I tried to run away, arms shielding my face from the greedy tendrils of flame. I got up and could see the force of the explosion had thrown several logs out of the pile. The sight that I saw in that fire then will haunt me to my dying day. I saw a face, upside down in the blaze. The woman's hair was aflame, and her eyes stared into my soul as her skin bubbled. It was Mrs. Peterson, buried beneath the wood, dead. The Petersons rose from their curled-up positions on the grass and looked towards me. They read the panic in my eyes and looked at the fire to see that horrifying sight. No, 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 screamed Mr. Peterson. I thought he was mourning his wife until he looked up with tearful eyes towards me. Oh, you've seen too much, kid. You were supposed to be our witness that we were nowhere near that house fire. He wasn't making sense, but he was advancing on me, determined. Jacob and his sisters slowly moved to surround me. Oh, I'm sorry for what I'm going to have to do to you, kid. We can't let you leave. My eyes shifted to all the faces in turn. They were all in on it. That told me all I needed to know. I hugged the remaining gas can at my feet, over my head and into the fire, and the fireball sent everyone cowering, like the destructive outburst of an angry deity. I didn't flinch. I had to get out of there before they killed me, their failed alibi. I pushed Jacob over as he staggered and booked it for the forest. I had no flashlight, but I had a will to live. I could hear noises over the rushing of the wind and rustling of the underbrush behind me. I'm going to kill you, you little snitch. It was pitch black now, but they didn't have flashlights either. Suddenly... A light shone behind me, a foam flashlight. Its weak beam lit up a decent-sized river with steep banks on either side ahead of me. I ran haphazardly down the bank and into the river up to my knees. Where is he, Dad? I heard from a few hundred feet away, out of sight above the bank. Crossing the river. We've got to catch him before he gets to the road. I looked to my right and saw a corrugated metal tube of a culvert below the train track. I threw a large rock as far as I could, in the direction the Petersons were running, and I heard, Gotcha now, from only twenty feet away. I dove into the large metal tube and lay back in the cramped space. It was big enough I didn't have to crawl in, but could lay my back against the edge and hide. I pulled out my phone and began to dial 911 in the darkness. Splashes erupted in the river as Mr. Peterson crossed it and kept running. Thank goodness I'd thrown that rock. As I tensely waited in my hiding place, I heard the rest of the family cross the river and gunshots. 911, what is your emergency? Words dropped from my mouth like water. Peterson's, edge of town, a big fire. They're chasing me. I need you to come help me. Oh, slow down, sir. Jesse. Okay, Jesse. Give it to me slow so I can send the police there. We'll also track the call to pinpoint your location while you talk. Jesse, where did he go? They were still searching for me and were still in the area. I gave dispatch the whole story in a panicked whisper, not wanting to be found. And after an agonizing half hour, I heard sirens and rustling leaves around my hiding place. Drop the gun, right now. I heard an unfamiliar voice shout. Jesse, come out. It's all right. I approached the house to see the whole family in custody. The fire put out. The paramedics on sight immediately wrapped me in a blanket. It is when I noticed I was shivering. I 
stared into the distance and spoke to the paramedic nearest me. They wanted to burn Mrs. Peterson's mother's house and then plant her burnt remains inside. The older man had no idea what I was talking about, but nodded silently to keep me talking. I was supposed to be their alibi. They had me sign some merit badge paper as evidence I was here at this time. And therefore, if they suspected, they would have evidence they were here. I collapsed in sobs into the man's shoulder, and he seemed startled, but held me close as I processed it all, eyes squeezed closed. After several long minutes, I looked up to see the Petersons being pushed into police cars. Their eyes told me that I would pay someday. And they were driven away. After the trial, I never saw the Peterson family again. My parents relocated to a different state for safety, or at least for peace of mind. I now live on my own, far away from that bonfire, from those woods, from that family. But I do still look over my shoulder for familiar faces who wish me harm. I'll tell you where I live, but you never know who may be reading. Better safe than sorry. Good night. Sleep well. Can't say I'll be sleeping tonight. So quite a mixed bunch for you there this evening. Um, something for everyone, I would like to think. <laughs> That's my excuse anyway. But thanks again to the three authors of those stories tonight for sharing them directly with me. I hope you enjoyed my renditions. Well, everything going well still here in the Netherlands. Settling in. Youngen's on his way to school every day. Um, try not to spend all my euros at once, but <laughs> having a, a very nice time. Lots of uh, bureaucracy to get through, but life moves on and... I think I've done it for a good reason, and everything's going well. So, thanks for all the well wishes over on YouTube and on Facebook and wherever you've been in touch with me, Twitter as well. Very much appreciated. Pretty tough moving countries with a family, I tell you, but glad I've done it and hoping for the best. Well, enough of this waffling. I will, of course, be back again with you very, very soon. Moving country doesn't stop me, you know. <laughs> okay, till the next time, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay? <laughs>